So welcome everyone to our new series, the Commodity Supercycle. And it's a pleasure and I'm honored and flattered actually to, to have David Hunter on the show. David, how are you today? I'm good, Mark. Thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure. The pleasure is all mine. <laughs> yeah, and I just saw it's the first time you appear on a German channel. So, hey, it's a historic interview, I guess. <laughs> it is for me, that's for sure. Yeah, but this time we won't do it in German. Next time, perhaps. <laughs> but <laughs> let's, let's start. I, I'm, I'm a big follower of you on Twitter. And um, you're bullish since March 2020. So in, in, in April 2020, um, you have been the only bull, actually, um, on the internet. But you were spot on, actually, Yeah, if you look back. So you were calling for a way higher stock prices back then. So why? And what did you see what nearly nobody else saw? Yeah, so I I was actually going into the into the swoon in March. I was actually looking for a melt up um, that uh, obviously the pandemic kind of short circuited. So when we had that thirty five percent very swift correction in the S and P, um, I certainly took a close look and I said, "Is this the beginning of um, bear market and bust that I also had been calling for?" I said, "When the cycle ended, it would end in a global bust." Yeah. Um, and I thought, gee, is it happening a little prematurely because of the pandemic? Took a look at all my work and I said, no, you know, sentiment's gotten so negative so quickly yeah. that I don't think this is this is more of a fake out. You know, I don't think this is a real the beginning of the real bear market. Um, and that was the start of me then looking and saying, is the melt up still intact? And it was as far as my work said. And I felt this was actually setting up for the melt up because we were gonna get a tremendous response from the um, central banks around the world, as well as um, fiscal response from the governments. And that's exactly what we've had. So I, I knew we were gonna see bigger than we had ever seen in terms of monetary uh, infusion. And that's usually what drives markets much higher. Um, so it was, and, and I'm a contrarian, so I had the best of both worlds because I had the what I saw coming in terms of the monetary. And of course, Jay Powell confirmed that pretty quickly. Uh, and then sentiment was as negative as it's been in many years. Um, and those two things are, are kind of um, magic for me. When I see both of those together, that's that's you know bullish. So so I and my my melt up call had been for probably 4,200. I, I kept that and said we could even exceed that. And then as we went through the past year, you know, I increased it first to 4,500 on the S&P and then up to uh, my current level of 4,700. And I've been pretty uh, candid about saying, I think if anything, I'm going to be too low, you know, that we could see even 5,000. So, um, you know, everything's intact right now. I'm still very bullish. Um, I still believe there's a global bus coming afterwards uh, and that. probably probably starting before this year is out. But, oh, okay. uh, but for right now, all, all things look good. I don't think you have more than a couple percent. You can always get a you know, couple percent pullback at any time. But I don't think there's much more downside than that. And you know, pretty clear sailing through the next at least next couple months on the upside. All right, awesome. So, um, what did you buy then back uh, in, in the last year in March or April 2020? What kind of stocks, ETFs, or what did you invest in? Yeah, as a strategist, I don't tend to talk, you know, my trading or any trading advice. Okay. Um, but what I will say is, you know, early on, I said, you know, you're going to see um, the the stocks that got us here are going to continue to lead right into the top, and that's still my view. So I'm. I'm still a bull on semiconductors and and the Fang stocks um, in terms of uh, you know and technology in general. Um, I also along the way was uh, pretty bullish on uh, industrials, commodities. Um, I can't remember exactly when I switched to each of those things, but I know last November I I was uh, pounding the table in terms of saying. We're, we're going to see a switch from, um, you know, you're going to see some of the laggers start to really catch up, particularly energy and financials, uh, along with some of the industrials. And that's certainly been, been the story the last six months. So, um, and now I think we may see some rotation. I think those groups continue 
higher into the top. But I think we're going to see some rotation um, back in in terms of leadership back into the uh, the stocks that get, got hit by uh, rising interest rates. Yeah. You know, I'm calling for a rate rally here. So I think you're going to see a shift back towards the fangs, um, towards technology, towards the growth stocks. And, and I think it could surprise people how how strong those are. They've had a pretty nice consolidation here for the last four or five months. Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting because other um, hedge fund managers, they see a switch from from value to, to uh, from growth to value, like um, Stan Brackenmiller or um, Felix Sulauf and so on, Raul Powell as well. So this is a contrarian um, opinion again you have. So this is interesting <laughs> if it would play out. So so what- Yeah, it's interesting. I think, yeah, I think that, you know, I find, in, uh, and not on those people specifically, but you know, in general, investors tend to extrapolate from behind. So they look backwards and then say, that's what's going to continue forwards. Yeah. We, yeah. we had that shift of value, obviously, starting last November. True. Um, we've had a big move. And basically, the FANG stocks have gone sideways for, yeah. you know, since the beginning of the year. Um, and so I think you're, you've set up a nice consolidation for the next leg up. Okay. Um, so, and you know, that's what that's what fuels that leg is the shift from those that are now saying value to where, as they see the momentum shift, they'll be the ones buying the the growth stocks up. Yeah. 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 So we are brother in minds because I'm a contrarian as well, and I also see a melt up because the um, central banks print like never before. They are in a crazy mood, actually. It's like a Tesla. But anyhow, um, so we talked about sentiment already. You mentioned it. So what do you expect for the next month? Yeah, probably, um, yeah, as I said, I'm expecting you know, the bond market to rally here. I'm, yeah. I'm calling for a 120 on the 10 year, probably a 195 on the 30 year. Um, And so I think as rates start coming down, that's going to help sentiment. You're going to see, I think, you know, as, and as the tape uh, improves on the stock market, you're going to see sentiment move up. So really, I know everybody's talking about how everybody's all in and bullish. But what I see out there is a lot of skepticism, people with one leg out. Uh, one foot out of the door and looking to exit. Everybody's looking for that top. At the, at the true top, I don't think you're going to have anybody looking for a top. They're going to be telling you why it can go on for years. Like so, always the same game. It's always the same game. <laughs> yes, it is. That's one thing. I've been doing this 48 years and every cycle looks, you know, of course, they aren't all the, exactly the same, but they sure look similar on sentiment basis. And so I, I think as we move through uh, the summer, you're going to see that sentiment move up into a much more bullish um, place. Yeah. And yeah, remember, remember in, in 1996, Alan Greenspan, he warned everybody about the expiration on the stock market that the Nasdaq is in a bubble already. But this, um, yeah, um, expiration actually went on for three and a half more years. And I think the, the, the biggest leg up was in, 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 in late 99, uh, early 2000. So it was the end of the bubble. And uh, I think the stock market's like, doubled more than doubled back then so what is your time frame when will this leg up this melt up this 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 this, this boom melt up boom and um, end and uh, what comes afterwards yeah this you know i get picked on a lot for this because i'm always looking for it to happen sooner but but it, the reason i'm calling for a top this year is because the slope has gotten so steep you know you're into um you know from last from march of 2020 obviously we've had a you know, more than double in the NASDAQ, you know, unprecedented moves in the markets. And so I think we are with this, you know, recent consolidation in the markets about to enter what I would call the last parabolic phase. And a parabolic phase um, or parabolic stage tends to be, it covers a lot of ground in a hurry. Um, and so it tends to be, you know, shorter in duration. So you can have, for example, You know, I'm calling for 17,000 on the NASDAQ. You can have from here a 25% move in the NASDAQ and yet say, well, it could be over this summer. So that sounds you know, unbelievable, but that's what the last parabolic phase can be. And so, you know, 
4,700 to 5,000 on the S&P, you know, 17,000 on the NASDAQ, 38 or 39,000 on the Dow. You know, you're talking about 15 to 25% moves that could happen in a matter of, you know, two or three months. And so I have people on Twitter, if you follow me, you see that say, hey, you said you were gonna, that we were gonna top out in the second quarter. You only have a few weeks, you know, you're wrong. And I go, I, first of all, I, I didn't say that. I said it could top out that soon. That's the earliest it could top out. Okay. Um, but the market, if it you know, stretches out its consolidation, it just stretches out the time frame. But I think we're getting close, you know, whether it's July or August or September doesn't really matter. Uh, if I were betting today, I'd probably say it could be over by Labor Day, by U.S. Labor Day, which is early September. Yeah. But, you know, the, the timing isn't the important thing. The point is we're in the very last um, stage of a what I call a 39 year secular bull market. So, you know, which month uh, is, is less important when you're you're 39 years into it. Yeah. So. Um... After this melt-up, you expect the biggest bust in the post-world area. Why? And what will we see? Sure. The, the simple answer, we just have so much debt that's been piled on to the global financial system over you know, the last 50 years, and particularly over the last two decades. Uh, you are now um, in excess of $250 trillion in global debt. Uh, and then there's quadrillions in notional value of derivatives, which is another form of, dev of leverage. And, and I think we're in a situation where inflation's picking up, the Fed's going to be forced, the Fed and central banks around the world, but particularly the Fed is going to be forced to tighten. And I think um, if the economy's overheating and, and inflation's you know, really heating up, It's not going to be people hear the words, you know, tightening or things like that. And they they kind of think it happens immediately or, you know, the, the response happens immediately. Tightening takes some time to actually have an impact. So inflation is going to be continuing to move up while they're tightening. So they have to tighten some more, you know, it'll play out over, I think, you know, three to six months. But um, but that tightening into a very leveraged very extended financial system um, can can lead to a very quick unwind. And I think leverage, as we learned in business school, leverage works uh, to enhance things on the way up and really exacerbate the, the pain on the way down. Uh, so, uh, I, you know, I may prove to be early again, but I continue to say we could see the bust start in the fourth quarter. So, um, that doesn't mean the whole thing's encapsulated in the fourth quarter, of course, but if it starts there, I think, I think we're looking at any, whenever it starts, I think we're looking at pretty much 2022 to be a, a pretty rough year in the economy. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I'm wondering actually, and many people as well, um, how can we have a deflationary bust when we see this crazy spending from governments, from central banks, they're printing like never before, I mentioned it already. So I also believe we will see a deflationary bust, a big one, the biggest one we've ever seen. So, but how can we explain it to the people, to the audience, when we see that sure. governments spend so much money like never before, trillions of dollars actually? Sure. Um, so... The, the fiscal on the fiscal side, you know, and I'll, I'll focus on, on the U.S. just because they're the elephant in the room. But, you know, President Biden is pushing, you know, trillions and trillions of new spending. We've already, you know, in the prior administration, you know, in the, the year after the, the pandemic started, you know, we were already spending trillions. And then you add on another you know, whatever it's going to be, five or 10 trillion, uh, it's, it's beyond belief. I mean, if somebody told you this five years ago, you said, you'd say that's never going to happen. Um, but the thing is, most of that spending, it, it doesn't get spent in the, you know, three months after it's announced. It's something that will fuel things going forward, but it's not, you know, it rolls out over time. Um, 
depending on what it is, you know, some of it is, you know, when you're when you're cutting checks in terms of pandemic relief for people, yes, that gets spent. Um, but uh, in terms of you know green energy projects or yeah. infrastructure projects, you know, you're talking things that are going to play out over several years, and they will influence the other side of the bus more than they'll influence, um, you know, preventing a bust. Um, and, and on the monetary side, um, you know, what I would say is, and again, this is something that I see on Twitter a lot, is people think it's just a simple equation of the Fed sees um, the economy getting soft, and so they just push a button and out rolls the money. They have to consider all kinds of things, you know, there's, uh, they're going to be dealing with inflation. And, and massive debt at the same time. So, and, and there's a lead and a lag to when policy has an impact. Fiscal lag is longer as I just explained, but even in monetary lag, it, you know, the money that rolls out doesn't really influence the economy for six or eight or nine months sometimes. So um, it, I guess the answer I would give you is that we're at the end of such an extreme cycle that things can happen fast in both directions. Yeah. So yes, you can have inflation looking like it's going through the ceiling and looking like, um, you know, the economy is very overheated and, you know, fast forward three, four five months and say, oh my God, the floor is falling out of the economy and inflation's heading for deflation. So. Um, that's not normal. In normal times, things play out over years. But because of where we are in the cycle, I think certainly the markets will respond quickly to tightening. Yeah. And then that will, I think, trigger financial problems across the board. So, you know, I, I guess I'd go back and say March of 2020 is a bit of a microcosm of what I think is coming. You know, we saw a 35% drop in the stock market yeah. in a matter of three weeks. So it, we're going to be at a more extreme place where you could see a, you know, 70 or 80% drop in the market in the course of a few months. No. Um, so I think it's going to be fast. Again, market is fast. The economy will be relatively fast. I think the, the bust will be mostly contained within 2022, but it, you know, so that's relatively fast for something that would normally play out over years. Yeah. But, but a year is an eternity when you're going through something like this. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not like, you know, I think investors' minds think something's going to happen and it's going to happen, you know, in like three weeks. Yeah. But <laughs> you know, the economy will play out over several quarters. Yeah. yeah. So you think the trigger will be the tapering from the Fed? Um, what about the repo? Can the repo also be a, a trigger moment for the markets that the um, bust will come? Yeah. Well, repo is part of okay. repo is really yeah. part of tapering. You know, that's okay. how you taper uh, or, or reverse repo. So they're they're actually pulling money out now. The Fed is. I don't know exactly what central banks around the world are doing, but the Fed has yeah. has slowed down the money growth. Um, you know, over the course of the last couple months, there's a lot of talk about taper. There's a lot of talk about is the Fed, and and this is what happens a lot of times. Is the Fed behind the scenes has actually done some of that already. So the market's held up. You know, you've gone you've gone in so, sort of a sideways direction here, up and down for you know several weeks. But really, you're you're um, you're working through some sort of a taper here. I would not be surprised, and again, this isn't a forecast, but it's just a, a possibility. I would not be surprised if in the course of the next couple of months, we get better news on inflation yeah, um, and maybe some weakness in oil. Um, and that that is the trigger for the rally in bonds. And all of a sudden, as, as is typically the case, you know, Wall Street goes from... 100% worrying about taper and tightening to then 100% worrying about are we heading into deflation? You know, it's like, yeah. you know, their, their thought process moves a lot quicker than the actual events happen. But, um, but I, I, that's what I, I would not be surprised is that you get the, you know, the backing off of that 
and so then the worry about gee the fed's going to have to you know tighten and, and that's going to lead to a bust you know mm-hmm. doesn't mean it's not going to happen it just means uh, the worry about it i think um softens so you expect the downturn in 2022 and um 80 90 from the levels then right now or in the future yeah my you know, basically i'm saying from from wherever we peak if it's you know, 47, 800 on the SP, if it's 5,000, that we're looking at a 70 to 80% decline in the stock market peak to trough. Okay. Um, so let's say just for uh, easy math, say we get to 5,000 on the S&P, you could get back to 1,000. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, we have not seen that kind of a drop since 1929 really. Yeah. Um, you know, we've seen some big drops. I mean, 2008, nine was a big drop. Um, you know, 1974 was a big drop. 87 was a big uh, 19, drop. 19, yeah, and 1987 was a big drop in a short while. Um, and of course, on the NASDAQ, you know, the, the 2001, you know, rollover was big. So, so it's not unprecedented really. But in terms of it, it, this would be the biggest bear market in the post-World War II era. Yeah. And, in our lifetime, uh, actually. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So what happens after the bust? So, um, and how will the central banks react, actually, on this bust? Yeah, so, so they will. And that's, you know, just to get back to how can this happen yeah. while the central yeah. banks are on, you know, on guard against this. But it's going to take time when this thing's unwinding fast. It's going to take time for them to get to a right size policy, because if things are unwinding because of massive leverage fast, then I think we'll have some major, major bank failures around the world. So it'll be a whole financial system that's melting down. You know, they're using you, they showed in March of 2020 they can put money in pretty quickly, yeah. but they've already done a lot of that. So they're a little cautious about doing something like that again. So it's going to be you know, initially a slower response and then things start happening fast on the downside. So then let's say they print a trillion dollars or pump a trillion dollars in a hurry and it does nothing. The, the swoon continues. They pump a couple more trillion. The swoon continues. So it's going to take time to get to a right size policy. And, you know, I, I have argued that we could see the Fed go from what will probably be an $8 trillion dollar balance sheet to a 20 trillion plus, you know, something between 20 and 30 trillion to deal with the bust. So you don't get there mentally right now. I mean, you know, the Fed, if, if you told the Fed today, they'd be putting $10 trillion dollars of new money into the system right from here. They'd say, you know, that we can't do that. And, but, it, but in the crisis, that's what it'll ultimately lead to. Uh, over the course of months, probably you know, weeks and months. Um, so, so that's how you get the bus. But then on the other side of it, that money that's being pumped in, if it is 10 or 15 trillion on the Fed, um, on a, you know, from the Fed and equal, proportionally equal amounts from every central bank in the world, because it's going to be a global bus. Um, you know, you can imagine that with a lag, and that lag is probably you know nine months. But with a lag, you start seeing the other side of that. And just like we did after March 2020. And, and so again, a microcosm, you look at where we're at now, we're talking about an 8% GDP in this country this year. And that's a result of what happened in March 2020 and beyond. So, you know, take that and multiply it times, you know, five or 10, and you can have a similar type situation where all of a sudden you come out of that trough and you come out, you know, in a pretty hot way. Um, and next thing you know, you've got inflation times 10. You know, you've got what we have right now, except, you know, it'll take some time. It won't happen in the first year, but in, probably in the second year of the recovery, you're going to start moving, you know, up the inflation curve very fast. And by 25, 26, 27, uh, I, I think you're going to be easily in double digits and, and moving towards 20% inflation rates. So when you step back and see what that is, that's basically saying we had 40 years of disinflation yeah. from, from 20% inflation rate in 1981 
um, down to zero and ultimately down to negative inflation in 2022. And then within three, four, five years, you've recycled, you've retraced that entire 40 year move, 40, um, 41, 42 year move. Um, and next, next thing you know, you're back at 20%. So you've done what took you 40 years to accomplish is undone in, in less than five. Yeah. That's what I think we're in for. Yeah. Um, so yeah. as I say, you know, the true gloom and doomers out there, the Peter Ships of the world, you know, can only see this collapse. And I don't think they realize that beyond the collapse, you will have one last cycle and it'll be a pretty unbelievable cycle in terms of if you're in, if you're in the industrial and commodity sectors, you will have a ride like we've never had. I mean, exactly. Um, That's what I said. You know. I wrote in my new book, actually, that we will see uh, the, the, dec the next decade will be the decade of commodities, of gold, of silver, of everything which is limited. And what will this do to the stock market, actually? Will we see new highs? Will the Dow Jones hit the 100,000? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm of the belief, and I'm pretty adamant about this, that the big bull market we've had, the secular bull market, um, that started in 1982 by my call. I sometimes say you could start it in 1974 because yeah. um, the, it was a lower low back then. But I used 1982, August of 1982, because that was the beginning of um, this whole disinflation move um, that led to PE multiples going from price earnings multiples going from single digits to now mid 20s um, for the market multiple. That was driven by the fact that interest rates went from a 15% 10 year down to, um, you know, 0.4, you know, in the past year. And I think ultimately we'll see the 10 year down to zero in yeah. the bust. Mm -hmm. um, but that multiple um, gets reversed when you go the other way, because if inflation goes to from negative to 20%, interest rates are going to go from negative back to, you know, 10 year will go back to 15%. If you have rates going back in that direction to that degree, obviously what's going to happen to price earnings multiples, they're going to, they're going to shrink. They're going to be compressed dramatically. So you'll go, you'll reverse that 40 year uh, multiple expansion and now have multiple uh, contraction through the next cycle. So, so then what happens is the overall market, if you're in an S&P index fund, you're gonna not be happy because let's say we get to 5,000 this year, um, the likelihood is in the next uh, bull market, it'll be a cyclical bull market, but a secular bear market. Um, in that cyclical bull market starting you know, later in 2022, it will probably top out somewhere below 4,000. So you won't get near 5,000. You won't get near the this secular peak. You'll have a, a run from say a thousand on the S and P to you know 3,000 or 4,000. So you can triple or quadruple out of the bottom. But you're you're looking at a secular top here, the likes of which I think serves as a high water mark for decades to come. Not a decade, but decades to come. Okay. And and so so that means it becomes more of an active manager's cycle where it matters where you put your money you know it always matters where you put your money but we had the benefit in the last 40 years of the pe multiple wind at our back so if you were in an index fund you know you basically did better than most active managers who were trying to pick stocks and didn't you know weren't in that um, growth area um, in the next cycle it'd be quite the opposite you're gonna have a you're gonna have a headwind of ever higher interest rates, pushing multiples down. So then what matters is picking those stocks that, that have are beneficiaries of inflation and the industrial recovery where their earnings can outstrip the inflation and interest rates. So, you know, it, it becomes a much more selective market. Active managers will be in their heyday um, and index funds will be the laggards, obviously, for a period of time, they'll be going up, but at some point, you'll be sitting there. If you if you 
buy into this buy and hold mantra and index fund mantra, at some point, say in 2024, you're going to be sitting there going, you know, my index fund is going nowhere. And I have friends who are invested in commodities who have doubled their money. Yeah. You know, what am I doing? Yeah. Yeah. So in this scenario, what will happen to the U.S. dollar? Um, I believe I'm, I'm a bear right now. I believe the dollar's headed um, in the next few months through the summer um, down to 85 on the dollar index wow. and perhaps down to 80. Okay. So, so it's somewhere between 80 and 85. And I'm, I'm thinking it may be the lower number. Um, but uh, from there in the bust, um, so that, that happens while we're in the melt up. Yeah. Um, and then in the bust, I think the dollar, uh, as it always has, I think one more time, it will be seen as the place to run for safety. Keep okay. in mind, we're looking at, we're looking at globally the worst economic contraction in the post-World War II era. So in the past 80 years, that means people are going to be frightened. That means they're going to say, where can I go? My, you know, everything I look at, including, I think the Euro is going to be in real trouble. They're going to say, where can I run to? And I think they're going to choose, you know, it's, the best shirt and the dirty laundry, basically, you know, they're going to choose the U.S. dollar, not because it's doing, you know, everything is great in the U.S. because we're going to be struggling big time, but they're still going to say, hey, this is still the, if anybody's going to survive this, it's going to be the U.S. So they will still run here one more time. Um, from there, though, and, and I think you could, let's say you get down to 80 or somewhere between 80 and 85, I think you could run the dollar up to 120 or higher um, in that during the bus, yeah. in, that, in that flight to safety trade. Um, and then wherever the high water mark is, whether it's 120, whether it's 140, uh, which is my upside of where it could go, um, from wherever that is in that next recovery cycle, because of the Fed's going to print more money than any any central bank. You know, every central bank's going to be printing, but we're going to be the big big one. I think we, you know, you what is, what is printing? What is what is uh, monetary ease? It's printing currency. You know, we're going to have such a supply of dollars out there, and and in conjunction with everything that the world is trying to accomplish against the dollar, that I think the dollar tops out wherever that run is during the bust. And I think from there, it's all downhill for the rest of the decade. So I would not be surprised to see the dollar sub 50 wow. um, okay. uh, by the end of the decade. So what, um, okay, this is very interesting because um, what would this mean for the, the status of the, of, the, of the dollar as a world currency? Will China overtake? Will China be the number one in the future or which currency do you see as number one then? Yeah, let me put it this way. I am not in the camp that thinks we're, we're in some reset. This bust is not going to lead to, is not going to be a reset, certainly not immediately. Um, I am not in the camp that thinks the dollar loses reserve status in the next five years. Okay. Okay. After that, all bets are off. Anything, anything in the latter part of the 2020s, anything is possible because we're going to be dealing with a worldwide crisis, the likes of which we've never seen. You can't, you can't have policy like we've had, um, you know, certainly in the last 20 years leading up to this, but what's, what's going to, what's happening in the last year and what's going to come in the next couple of years is beyond anything that any system can withstand. Think about it. You know, I can throw around numbers on inflation um, and on markets and on, you know, GDP, how, how, I can't, I can't tell you how um, a budget gets financed that is, you know, has um, um, debt to the levels I'm talking. You know, uh, everybody's talking about a, a debt peak here, you know, that this is the super cycle peak in debt. I go, no, because of the bust, you have one more leg up. So 250 trillion or slightly above that now is probably going to go to something like 350 or 400 trillion 
by the end of the decade and most of that in the next few years. How do we finance that, not just the US, but around the world with inflation rates and interest rates in not only double digits, but ultimately high double digits? It can't happen. There's no equation that I can come up with. That leads to a much bigger collapse. I mean, so, you know, I, I pretty much say that beyond, and I'm, I don't have any precise timing, but I'm using, I'm saying this, you know, the, the next cycle is going to be a short one. Maybe it lasts a decade, you know, the rest of this decade, maybe it cut short of that. But I believe the 2030s is going to be a depression many, many times what this world saw in the, in the 1930s. Mm. I mean, it's a, it's a collapse of the entire financial system as far as I can see, because I don't see any equation that can solve it. Exactly, exactly. So I, don't, I don't really worry about, gee, is China's, you know, is the yes. yuan going to take the place of Doesn't the dollar? Matter. Or are we going to see a, a, a basket currency? Hey, none Doesn't of that matters. I exactly. mean, we're talking exactly. about something that is a worldwide collapse. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, I agree. My last best-selling book was called The Biggest Crash of All Times. And that's what I actually predicted as well. And I'm really afraid that it will happen. There is no solution within the system. We see the, the central banks, the politicians have only one answer to all these problems. It's printing money and making more debt. But it never worked. It didn't work in Zimbabwe. It didn't work in Argentina or in the Weimar Republic. So it's, it's all the same game again. But we forgot because it's... An, next generation problem. So anyhow, how can we prepare for this scenario, uh, for inflation, for deflation, for this depression? So how to invest, how to protect your wealth and your, your money, actually? Yeah, as a, as a strategist, I, I pretty much can only forecast. I have to shy away from any kind of advice. Yeah. Um, but what I will say is basically, um, you know, the, the roadmap I laid out, tells you pretty much if you think about it, you know, the next, you know, you've got a, you've got a short window here um, into a top, uh, you know, the next few months. And, and then you've got, you know, the biggest market decline in over 80 years coming, if I'm right. Um, and then you've got a fairly short cycle driven by industrial and commodity stocks um, and basically, you want to end the decade debt-free, uh, financially um, sound, um, and, and with as much liquidity as you can have. Beyond that, you know, I, I do believe gold's going to 10,000 plus, and I don't know what that plus is. Is it is it 12,000? Is it 15,000? I don't know. But by the end of the decade, I think we'll see gold there. We'll see silver 300 plus. And again, I don't know if it's 400 or 500, whatever that plus is. But, um, you know, they will be great through this decade. Um, the question is, what what do you do in, in uh, you know, an un, there's no precedent for what's coming in the 2030s, yeah. in my opinion, and it's and it's obviously it's financial, it's economic, but it's also geopolitical. And who knows what comes out of that vacuum? My fear is it's totalitarian. My fear is that uh, all the events leading, you know, that have been going on for the last 50 years are leading towards, you know, this new world order is all leading towards communism, etc., and totalitarianism. So my fear is that's what fills that vacuum wrongly, but um, who knows? I mean, I am not in the camp. There are a lot of people out there that are wishing for the reset, saying, oh yeah, let's have the collapse now so we can just start over. That's not how it's likely to work, you know? Uh, nobody should be wishing for what's coming because I, I think it's really dire. Yeah. Um, and I don't like saying that because I, you know, I tell people focus on the here and now, um, you know, take care of your, your details now. Um, don't, you know, compartmentalize. Don't, don't spend your time worrying about what's going to come in the 2030s because it'll paralyze you. Mm. You know, you need to do this, you know, the things that you can do now um, and focus on the now. Um, you know, that's the only way I can forecast. If I, if I, you know, thought about what I think is coming, 
if I spent my time thinking about that, you know, I wouldn't sleep at night. <laughs> so I think you, you really do have to focus on, um, you know, first the melt up coming and then the, you know, the bust that's coming and then know that there is a recovery after that bust. Don't get caught in the, what I call the gloom and doomers that are telling you we're down for the count in the next year. You know, mm -hmm. there is, there is a recovery cycle. And the reason there is a recovery cycle is simply because in deflation, the fed and the central banks have virtually infinite ability to print money. Yeah. And ultimately if you print enough money, you will get a recovery. So um, the problem after the recovery is that we're going to have, you know, we're, we're going to be between a rock and a hard place. You're going to have hyperinflation and fragility both. And when the Fed, and so the central banks will be out of the game. You know, they can't pour more fuel on an already roaring fire. That's what happened in the early 80s. You yeah. know, you, you know, if you have hyperinflation, the central banks are out of the game. Yeah. The reason we can have a recovery cycle is because the central banks are going to have infinite ability to respond to it because the inflation is lagged. You know, that if it if the money led to inflation in three months, they couldn't do it. But you print money today, it doesn't cause inflation for a couple of years or not high, certainly not high inflation. So so you have that freedom to say, I'm dealing with what I see right in front of me, which will be a bust. I'm not dealing with the consequences of that money that I'm printing that is going to lead to inflation, you know, in the mid twenties, I got to deal with what's right in front of me. Yes. So that's why you can have a recovery because they all have, you know, unfettered ability to print money. Mm. Yeah. So you mentioned gold and silver as a safe haven for the next couple of years till the end of the decade. What about the digital gold Bitcoin? Yeah, I did not follow Bitcoin. Um, I don't, you know, the cryptos to me have not been tested. You've got to get through the bust and see whether they're, you know, what what they're going to be in that. Obviously, you've got risk of government intervention, all of those things. So right now, I mean, it and, and not immediately right now because it's selling off. But in in the last many months, it's been a you know something that's moving up. So you got a lot of people jumping on the bandwagon. Why are they jumping on it? Because they understand it? No, they're jumping on it because it's making money. Exactly. You know, it's no different than a, you know, a hot stock um, that is going straight up. And we know what happens when things go parabolic and then, you know, they correct. So I'm not, I'm, I don't follow Bitcoin. So I'm not making a, a recommendation okay. one way or the other. Yeah, I can't anyway as a strategist, but, but um I would say just that it's an untested thing, I think. And and there's a lot of people out there claiming they understand it and et cetera. Um, I think those voices will be a lot less if it continues to sell off because it's, you know, a lot of it's being generated by the, the you know, the, yeah. the momentum. Um, so, you know, I, okay. I think. Yeah. What about um, commodities, mining stocks, stocks in general, um, oil? Will this be a safe yeah, the, the thing I would say, I, I do think oil in the next cycle is going to go to $300 plus. Until uh, the again, end of the decade that. or which, which time frame? Um, that will be after the bust, be okay. between, between the end of the bust and the end of the decade. Um, and I think you could see it ramp up pretty quickly so that by 2027, you might be there. You might be at 300 that quickly. Wow. Um, you know, you're, you're going to, you're going to hear peak, uh, peak oil again, as a, as a mantra out there yeah. in not too many years, because it's even worse than ever, because obviously with um, the policies coming out of the Biden administration, um, they're limiting supply, um, and you know we're we're gonna we're gonna see in oil what we've seen in lumber, what we've seen in um, you know the metal, steel, and copper, and all of those. Where all of a sudden you go from just in time inventory and demand roaring away, and and what we've seen in semiconductor chips. You know, all of a sudden there's a shortage because we we plan for a much less of a demand picture than we're getting. I think that's what you'll see in the next cycle. 
because think if if the world is going to be as I've said, um, the next cycle is going to be an industrial driven cycle. We haven't had an industrially driven cycle yeah. um, ex China since um, since the nineteen uh, seventies. So you know the last forty years has been consumer driven. If we go to a industrially driven cycle, that demands a lot more energy and particularly a lot more fossil fuels. So you can see oil, I think demand go through the roof and supply is just not gonna be there. So price give, you know, price goes straight up. Um, the, the thing that I do wanna caution people is just remember, I, I use the analogy, which I'm, you know, in this country anyway, of standing on the, um, south peak of the Grand Canyon and looking across to the north peak and thinking it's a straight line across um, and not realizing there's this big canyon in between. Well, that's like buying, you know, the um, commodities this year. And I'm not saying right now is the top because they can go higher with into the top, but, but, you know, buying the commodities here in the next few months thinking it's a straight line to the commodity cycle in you know 2023 and beyond that bust in between is a big canyon i think you're going to see commodities get hit very hard during the bust because demand's going to fall through the floor so just you know they're not a safe haven in the bust long term they are definitely have a lot more room upside um, to go but just know it's not a straight line um, that that'd be my only message there perfect David, it was an incredible interview. I thank you very much already. I've got one last question, and this is something totally different than financial advice or um, macroeconomics. And we had now a dark yeah, outlook for the future. So, but what is for you, for David Hunter, what is the meaning of life? Huh. Wow. Um. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say this, and the, you know, the older you get, the more you, you wish you realized this more when you were younger. But um, you know, it's it's a, something that people say when you leave this earth. You know, it's not going to be you know those stock picks I made or the forecasts I made that matter. What matters your your real legacy is what you leave behind in terms of um, what you teach children. Um, you know, um, what you teach your grandchildren or the times you spent with your grandchildren, the memories they have of you, yeah. uh, hopefully good ones. Um, and uh, to me, I think if people could learn this lesson earlier, it's always good. I mean, I did know it all the way up to some degree, but I will say it's, you know, being 69 years old now, I really, you know, I enjoy and treasure those moments with my grandkids and seeing the innocence in their eyes, you know, and things like that. So that's, to me, that's the meaning of life, not this stuff. This stuff kind of keeps us going. It's it's yeah. our hobbies or our livelihoods, but it's it's really your families that matter. Yeah, true. So, hey, I, I won't stop you. Go and play with your grandkids. So where can people find more about you? I'm sure the best way to um, find uh, my work is on Twitter. I'm on there, if not every day, several times a week, um, you know, tweeting uh, my views. So uh, if you go to at Dave H Contrarian, uh, you'll find me there. I will, and I, do write... the, I will put a link in the, in the show notes, of course, and I recommend everybody who's watching this to follow David. It's definitely worth it. Yeah, thank you. And I, I do write a um, quarterly investment letter and I, it's, it's, you know, by subscription. So there is a cost to it. If people have an interest, they can direct message me on Twitter and I'll give you details. Um, but, um, you know, I, um, those are kind of my two outlets. Cool, cool. Yeah, we will have you back definitely, ho hopefully soon. Um, have fun playing with your kids. Um, I enjoyed it a lot. It was an honor to have you on my show. And yeah, take care, stay healthy. And yeah, the best to you. Yeah, same to you, Mark. And thanks for having me on.